smallest Occupy uh, anniversary around the world because of the global, in the global economy, the Australian economy has come out best in the crisis. We're certainly not booming. The boom that the Reserve Bank and the Treasury are thinking we're coming our way through mining. Uh, if this is a boom, I don't want to see a bust because not getting below 5% unemployment uh, is not usually what we used to call a boom. But nonetheless, Australia has come out of it better than any other country on the planet and therefore we have a very, very small rem uh, remembrance group here. But we are remembering something that is still happening. And that's the bizarre thing about this crisis. If we were talking about any previous recession, like back in the 1990s recession, or uh, the early that the, back in the early 70s and so on, the anniversary would be a party on Wall Street for how high the stock market was now getting to be and the booming economy. If you go back to the 92 recession, for example, in America, that led to the election of Bill Clinton, it was known as the, the Bush Senior Recession, and Clinton got elected on the slogan of, it's the economy, stupid. I'll leave that one hanging for a moment. Um, but that, that, by 1997, you're in the middle of the, what was first of all the telecommunications bubble and then what became known as the dot-com bubble, leading up to the bust of 2001. But certainly within five years, the crisis was completely over and the only thing people remembered was that uh, they were glad they got rid of Bush Senior and they'd never elect another Bush again. Something went wrong there too, didn't it? So the fact that we're still in the middle of an economic crisis, which of course we're getting the smallest dose of it down this end of the planet, but the, we're still in a crisis and that crisis now in Europe is no debate is as bad as the Great Depression for several countries in Europe. So it's still going five years later. Now that is not your normal garden variety post-World War II recession. And this is why it was first nicknamed a Minsky moment by uh, some wag who I'm sure hadn't actually read much of Minsky before he wrote the word. And the reason I came out calling the crisis, I've read, started reading Minsky, Homer Minsky's work on financial instability, something like, uh, 25 years ago, and I regarded his vision as being the accurate description of both the strengths and the weaknesses of a capitalist economy. And the essential weakness that he saw was, he actually described it rather curiously, conventional left-wing critics of, of, of capitalism tend to say capitalism is going to suffer from crises of disproportionality or of inadequate effective demand, etc., etc. Minsky put it down beautifully and said, the fundamental instability of capitalism is upwards. Capitalism has a tendency to turn doing well into a speculative bubble. And that's precisely what we've seen happen, obviously dramatically before this crisis began. But he also talked about a tendency for the level of private debt to be driven up by a series of cycles because to finance that speculative bubble, you borrow money from the banking sector. The banking sector is willing to finance speculation because if they just finance investment and consumption, they remain small fry. And bankers, as you may have noticed, don't like being small fry. So they actually happily finance people gambling on asset prices, on housing, which is of course the favorite pastime in Australia, and shares, the favorite pastime in America. And each time they do, you're, paying, you're driving up the price of the assets but you're not driving up the number of assets. You're not improving the society's capacity to service that debt. So you go through a bubble, you then have a crash because most of that so-called investment is actually gambling. Anybody here remember Alan Bond? Yeah. That sort of person gets funded from banks. They're basically Ponzi schemers. The definition that Minsky gave of a Ponzi merchant was someone who has debt servicing costs that exceed the cash flow of the businesses they own. So they desperately have to continue getting finance. Otherwise, they will be declared bankrupt, which they already are effectively bankrupt. And they survive by selling an asset on a rising market. Now that sort of behavior is what the type of finance we see being practiced up and down Martin Place and in Wall Street is actually allowed to happen. And finance has become the dominant philosophy in capitalism. And a little old bloke called with the first name of Carl put this very well back in the 19th century. You said, talk about centralization. The bankers and the vast benches of parasites who surround them periodically get the chance to dominate industrial capitalism. And this bunch of parasites knows nothing about production and should have nothing to do with it. Now we're learning that lesson yet again, a century and a half after 
marks virtually a century and a half after Marx made those comments. And as I said, the person who uh, gave us the best way to put that together was a guy called Hyman Minsky. Now, one thing about the Occupy movement is an education process. I hope a lot of people are learning and reading about different ways of thinking about society and capitalism in particular than they would have done before the crisis. But the one I recommend is Hyman Minsky. And I've just actually recently received a T-shirt. I'm glad the sun's come out here. I would have frozen trying to do this with the shade a moment ago. Okay. Stability is destabilizing. That's Minsky's classic statement. So there's a bunch in England who are making this T-shirt now. I recommend getting a few copies to pass around. I love Hyman Minsky's South Park, don't you? <laughs> but that's the real message. Capitalism has to be seen for its strengths as well as its weaknesses. So I'm going to start with one of the strengths. And that is, it's the most innovative society human society has yet generated. As much as where people around this room would be often critics of capitalism, we're being critics of capitalism using technology that has been designed in capitalism. And you can make the comparison of what happened in the Soviet Union with the level of industrialization and technology there. Go back to 1960 and you see Nikita Khrushchev smashing his, his uh, shoe at the United Nations, shouting, we will bury you. What he meant was he believed he'd bury the West in the productive capacity of the Soviet Union. Instead, what we finally saw was people tearing down the walls to get away from a system which hadn't produced that large S. Capitalism does it. So that's one of the strengths it has. But the weakness it has as well is that strength comes from the engineers and the industrial capitalists. And they're the ones that are actually beneficial in how humanity can develop over time, improve the technology, sometimes improve society. They're not always, obviously. But it's the financial capital who take over and cause catastrophes like the one we're in now. And that's the sort of thing we have to find a way of preventing. The trouble is, when the catastrophe is caused, the same thinking that gave rise to it, which is simplistic economic theory that doesn't recognise the complex system the economy actually is, that thinking normally goes through a total wet your pants syndrome and does everything in the opposite of what it recommends in the actual crisis which is what we saw. So you had people like Geithner and Summers and all the advisors Obama unfortunately stuck with, pumping out money like born again drunken Keynesians. But when they're back in power again, they start spouting wonderful little ideas like, and have, take this one for a beautiful idea, expansionary fiscal consolidation. Isn't that a hot term? Now that, the first time they actually tried to think up a way to describe this, they called it something even sexier than that. That was reverse Ricardian equivalence. Well, that really went over like a real you know, house on fire. So they finally coined the term austerity. And this is now what they're saying is the necessary way of getting out of the crisis, which they see as being caused by too much public debt. So they're squeezing the public sector, making the public sector reduce its spending by simple things like making people who really benefited from the boom beforehand pay for the crisis afterwards. People like single mothers, pensioners, the unemployed, you know, they're the ones who really benefited from the boom, didn't they? They're the ones paying for it now through austerity. The idea is that they, they argued literally that every dollar cut from government spending would lead to one dollar or more of private spending, therefore causing a boom. You like that one? Okay. Expansionary. That's why they call it expansionary. They said every dollar... When you read this stuff, you think, you know, what are you on and where did you get it? I didn't have drugs that good in the 60s. You know? But one of, one of the things they come up with is, is this argument that this, this one is called Ricardian equivalence, that if you have an increase in taxes now, people will spend more because they know they don't need to save money for their future generations to pay taxes because taxes will be lower in the future. Therefore, they spend more now. That's the logic. Literally, as I say, you'd have to be, well, getting stoned doesn't cut it to come up with an idea like that. But that's, that's the sort of concept that's behind imposing austerity on Europe. Now, that austerity has led to unemployment in Greece now being over 25% of the population, the same in Spain. And this is a definition of unemployment, which if we applied it back in the Great Depression, would give you an unemployment rate of about 35%. Because it asks you, first of all, are you out of work? But secondly, have you applied for a job in the last four weeks? Now, if you answer, no, I haven't applied for a job in the last four weeks, you're recorded as not being in the labour force, and therefore you can't be unemployed. But even on that definition, one in four Greeks and one in four Spaniards qualifies. 
Now the result of that austerity is supposed to have been to boost the economy and also to, you take a dollar out of government spending, government income doesn't go down because the normal economy continues ticking over and paying those taxes, so you reduce your deficit and you get back to a wonderful booming economy. In fact what happens, uh, and even the IMF has recently studied this, the IMF report came out last week with Olivia Blanchard, one of my favourite fall guys for neoclassical economics. Doing research down the back of the document, or in a box of the document, that concluded that for every dollar cut from government spending, the fall in private expenditure was about $1.50 to $1.70. So fiscal expansionary fiscal consolidation does not work. They know that, but they're still continuing down the same path. Now what it means is you set a target of reducing deficits to say five, from 6% of GDP to 4%. You do the fiscal consolidation, you get to 5.5%, not the 4% target you had. So you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And each time unemployment rises because the economy is falling further and further. Now the ultimate end of that is either one of two things. It's zero or fascism. Because only the fascists, unfortunately, are willing to chuck this stuff out and be brutal. And that's what we're now seeing in Greece. A party that used to be a complete joke, Golden Dawn, is now the third largest party by the level of popular vote where a vote held today in Greece. And that is literally giving rise to the potential for Southern European fascism. Only, and they will break the rules. And then at that point we might see a shift. It's a great tragedy, but that's exactly what happened in the Great Depression. Austerity being imposed on the Germans gave rise to Hitler. And I, amazingly, we're repeating the same mistake in a different country by following those policies. So how long are we going to see this? How many more anniversaries are you going to have? I've got bad news for you, if the weather stays like it was earlier today, at least five. Because what's causing this crisis is the private sector being in too much debt, not the public, and the private sector now reducing that debt and therefore spending less than it earns. And that continues driving you down until the private debt's been reduced. In America's case, they've paid down their debt by roughly half a year's GDP, from 300% to 250% of GDP in the last five years. But to get back to where they were in the 60s, when the debt that existed was mainly financing what we need debt for, which is to finance investment and entrepreneurial, what a great word, entrepreneurial activity, that would take another one and a half years of GDP worth reduction of debt which could take another 15 years. Now, humanity can't afford that length of time because what happens in that situation is people, the ordinary people, the working class people, the middle class people who suffer through that, abandon the concept of liberal democracy and go for the extreme solutions because only the extremists will break those rules. We can't afford to have our society turned into a bastion for right-wing extremism at the point we are in human history now. So we have to fight that nonsense. Now partly it's through the type of movement you're trying to organise here and I think you might find next year's anniversary has a large number of people at it, but it also comes out of understanding the economy better. And that's one reason I've done what I've done, coming out in public and making the, the, uh, the claims I do, because I'm part of a group of renegade economists who've been around for 40 years arguing that conventional economic theory known as neoclassical theory is absolutely suicidally wrong about the nature of capitalism. And if we're going to avoid this crisis again, we have to get rid of a suicidally bad theory. And that takes activism not just in Martin Place but in the universities as well. And activism that would actually include the business sector because in many ways business people, and they're doing better than most people around this podium here, they suffer as well from these insane theories. They boom for a while, they can suppress unions at various times, some stuff that they like, but ultimately it leads to catastrophes like the one we're in now, which are leading to the unravelling, certainly of the retail and the manufacturing sectors in this country. So th there's room for a, a broad coalition against financial capitalism, which is the real danger in capitalism, not the industrial side. There's a room for a coalition against financial capitalism and against bad economic theory. And I hope to see you all helping me in that as the years go on. Thank you.